Okay, uh, it records to the cloud, then I can um, maybe with private and I'll do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, can you see the recording button? I'm... Hello? Yeah, it's recording. Yeah, it's yeah, recording. It's, it's yeah. recording. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So, <clears throat> so let's uh, continue a little bit on. Uh, okay. Uh, that so we said uh, dark matter should be stable. Uh, non interacting. When I say non interacting, I mean collisionless. And then uh, it should be chargeless. So it should be neutral. Here we meant it at least at cosmological scales. So, uh, so these properties, uh, we want to, uh, what our problem is that uh, we are not interested in solving the dark matter problem, meaning uh, fixing all the observables and everything. What we are more interested in is finding a particle candidate, which can be dark matter. So uh, today we will see um, at least one, we will see at least one actually, let's see. <clears throat> okay, so this uh, particle dark matter, which can be, uh, what can be, so what we said was it should be stable. Under these properties, many of the standard model particles, which are more than one generation will not survive, okay? WZ masses will not survive. Higgs mass will not survive. Higgs particle will not survive. And WZ will not survive. Uh, all the short-lived particles, uh, uh, which are essentially like anything from second generation onwards, all the second generation particles will not uh, be possible. So only other possibility would be UD and then a new E, e in the leptonic sector, first generation, and the corresponding right-handed contribution. So both left and right, we can think of. Out of this, uh, uh, we now know that uh, this is not going to be, uh, what, is, uh, what do you call it? Uh, electrons and everything will not help. Huh? There is there is somebody waiting in the lobby. Okay, one second. Oh, okay, here. Yeah. Yeah, once I share the screen, I cannot see who is in the lobby. Oh, thank you. Right hand particles. Uh, now, of these, the first generation quarks, uh, quarks, they form neutrons and protons. Neutrons have a lifetime of 15 minutes, roughly. So they are not uh, dark matter candidates. Now, protons are baryonic, so they cannot be dark matter candidate. 
uh, pions and all other things really uh, mesons you can forget about them because they are extremely short lived also and they are baryonic so so what we are left is uh, electrons and neutrinos okay electrons essentially are charged so they cannot be dark matter candidates so even though they are long lived and everything the only other possible candidate is neutrinos so neutrinos could be possible candidates but we argued the other day that the active neutrinos active means uh, neutrinos which interact with electrons muon stuff so essentially active neutrinos which um uh, which participate in uh, ultra, uh, weak interactions okay so the sum of all the active neutrons sigma m nu i mass over three generations should be less than or equal to 1 nu okay so this is not sufficient this is not sufficient for neutrons to form uh, dark matter they can at most form some part of dark matter not fully okay even that okay we we'll discuss that okay let's go <clears throat> so they can they don't have enough mass or uh, they don't really participate in uh, uh, enough in weak interactions actually uh, meaning they uh, what i'm saying uh, they participate enough in weak interactions but their interaction strength is so low that uh, uh, they need to and also their mass is so low They they typically free stream, okay, free stream. So they don't form something called cold dark matter. Okay, okay. In another words, what I'm going to say is that their masses are so low that they remain relativistic. For late times of evolution. okay so they really remain relativistic but so what happens is they don't really allow for structure to form so if they if they really form the entire part of cold dark matter you won't have structures in the universe so they don't allow for structures to form large scale structures many galaxies and so on so to form so for this reason um, because they remain relativistic okay they are not actually cold dark matter what we need is cold dark matter like we are doing last time uh, in the in the last lecture that we need cold dark matter they don't really form cold dark matter but then the other day we introduced some new particle which is called new r okay new r is uh, useful for um uh, uh neutrino masses right so neutrino mass uh, the red handed neutrino which is useful for neutrino masses okay new r can be something called warm dark matter but then to explain neutrino masses uh, it's slightly you have to do some fine tuning essentially so can be because what we saw was to explain neutrino masses you need some seesaw mechanism to take place and so on so so the same analysis can go ahead okay so in this case new r would be of the order of kv uh, kv kilo electron volts to roughly around hundreds of kv okay so the new r can be warm dark matter okay so in this case the masses are around uh, so you can still make this setup work with new r neutrino masses everything you can still make this setup work but it won't solve all the problems i say actually 
It is very instructive to read this paper by Shaposhnikov. Ah, uh, so is called spelling and writing, right? Uh, uh, who tried to solve all the physics beyond standard model problems just by adding right hand and neutrons into the theory, except the hierarchy problem. Just forgetting hierarchy problem, is there still a possibility to solve, say, baryon lepton asymmetry, neutrino masses, dark matter, everything just by adding right hand and neutrons to the theory, to standard model. So he has a series of papers. I advise you, all of you, to write, uh, read these papers by Shaposhnikov and company. This is the simplest physics beyond standard model you can have. I'll, I'll talk about it, but anyway, okay. So, so this is the this simplest. New are, sorry, will this new are yeah, yeah. Uh, somehow your Stop voice is popping. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, but I, I cannot hear you properly. Can you speak loudly? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. I'm asking that uh, this uh, new R can solve this problem of structure formation? This new R can form the, uh, solve the problem of structure formation. Okay. <clears throat> Um, now this uh, warm, cold, okay, um, okay, up to a certain extent, actually warm, cold, and uh, hot dark matter. There used to be something called hot dark matter earlier. It's now ruled out, actually, there's no rooms for it, in which neutrons also used to satisfy, uh, but they have masses around 5 EV, okay? So 5 EV, uh, that is called hot dark matter, actually. Even that was uh, sort of uh, popular for a while. Okay. Um, but now, I think the last 10, 15 years, I think this hot dark matter is completely rolled out. But you have something in between, between cold and hot dark matter, which is called warm dark matter. Actually. Uh, hot dark matter idea, you can read those papers. I don't know how many. <laughs> this paper, there's no point in reading those papers, but I don't know. If, uh, these days, nobody is discussing this actually. For uh, warm dark matter, I suggest start reading these papers of Shepushnik and company. And also, um, there are a couple of books by Peebles. One of the books discusses, okay, uh, Peebles Cosmological Physics or something. Okay, have a look at it actually. <clears throat> So he, I think I cannot think of any book uh, right now, uh, which maybe there is this some new books on dark matter. I think uh, John Van Krobe Bertone has a new book on dark matter. Uh, who else has? Uh, somebody else also has. Uh, Jan Mabrini has a book on dark matter. Okay. I don't know what is contained in these books, but I am suggesting because these are the latest books. Because dark matter changes significantly. Okay, Anne Mambrini has a dark matter book. Then Jan Franco. Uh, as a book on dark matter. Uh, who else? Uh, so th this may these books may contain something actually. So, may contain all the basic definitions and all the problems. Kind of. uh, yeah, Jan actually told me to read this book, but I couldn't get it in India. For Bertone, I saw it that uh, it's coming up. Uh, Jan's book is around 4,000 rupees in India. It's too expensive, but I think it may be worth it because uh, knowing him, I know he doesn't. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So now, 
Now, let's look at uh, this is uh, these three conditions. One, it should be stable. One, it should be non-interacting. Now, but of course, it should be gravitationally interacting. Um, interacting it should be neutral which is correct so we, let's say that let's look at what are all the possible other possible interactions dark matter can have so can it have strong interactions no if it, the moment it has strong interactions it falls okay there are exceptions it falls under something called uh, baryonic dark matter so we'll rule it out so it can be detected so can it have uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, somebody is pinging me on game set. Uh, can, uh, can it have uh, electromagnetic interactions? No. Oh, okay. Uh, electromagnetic interactions? No, that's also not a possibility. Okay. American is joining. So, uh, electromagnetic interactions? No. So, the only other interactions which it could have is weak interactions. So the only other interactions which it could have is weak interactions, which is interesting in a sense because it's inspired by neutrinos. So it is a neutral like particle, stable, okay? But it participates in weak interactions. So this came under the idea. There are several dark matter candidates we cannot uh, uh, cover all of them, but for uh, BSM physics, let's consider one particular dark matter candidate, which is interesting, which goes under the name WIMP. Uh, the personal idea, I don't know whether it's covered in his books or not, but read his original papers. This is pretty good. He tries very, very hard, actually. Very, very hard. Not only really satisfied dark matter and also uh, everything. Okay. So what is this weakly interacting massive particle? It has a new particle. Let's call it Kai. Is massive, but has some weak interactions. Okay, some meaning it's not uh, little. What are meanings? We don't know what exactly the kind of weak interactions. It's also neutral. So it's exactly like a neutrino. Exactly like a neutrino. Imagine that it's uh, some sort of a heavy neutrino. Okay, but it need not have the weak interactions of the neutrino. It need not have exactly the same weak interactions of the neutrino. <laughs> Okay, so it could have some small variations in the coupling, some uh, weak interactions. So typically, so then what we'll consider is that this is stable also. So it's not decaying. Okay, and so it's decaying is, uh, it's not going to decay. Uh, it's stable. <clears throat> uh, if you consider decaying dark matter, it's a different ball game. Uh, we'll not bother about it. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, decaying dark matter uh, can it be a beam? Yes, it's a possibility, but uh, it's a different uh, class. Uh, it's it's a different analysis, but the WIMP, I want to cover the WIMP because WIMP has some very nice features actually. So that is the reason why it is important that everybody knows about WIMP and where we stand on it. Sir, uh, okay. so for it to be non-decaying, then it, it must have some uh, limit on how massive it can be. Uh, no, as long, okay. You are right that typically, uh, if there is a heavy particle, it should decay into lighter particles. Okay. Mm -hmm. Suppose if it has symmetry. Okay. Okay. Protecting its mass. 
So in most cases, what happens is there is a symmetry which protects its mass so that it remains stable. Okay. Okay. So if it doesn't have a symmetry, you're right. Meaning it should, uh, it will always decay into lighter particles. Heavy particles should decay into lighter particles. But if it has some symmetry, it can remain there. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning it remains stable, but it can annihilate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Say, for example, um, chi, 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 anti chi can annihilate to say some weak interaction, so it should participate in some Z and some FF bar. Okay, this is a possibility. Annihilation is a possibility. Now, if we want to remain in thermal equilibrium, now what happens in uh, Early universe is Big Bang cosmology. Now, actually, uh, what Camillo raised is a very important point. Let me just take uh, a couple of minutes on it, actually. Uh, it's not automatic that a particle remains stable in most PSM physics. Okay? In most models of dark matter, Okay, let me just, uh, so I think it's an important point what she raised. Before I move further, I just want to say something about it, actually. Um, stable. So in most models of dark matter, one explicitly imposes a symmetry. to keep it stable. So this is a very important point that in most models, if you think of any model, the symmetry could be discrete, the symmetry could be continuous, okay? In some cases, the symmetry is hidden, okay? The symmetry is hidden or it is automatic or so or so, okay? but. In every case where the dark matter is stable, it has some symmetry to predict it. Say, for example, uh, uh, like, like let's just take a scalar particle. Okay, I will talk about two examples. So one is a scalar and the one is a firm, uh, beam, essentially, beam from me. Uh, if we get to there, what anyway. Okay, so the beam for me on. Uh, 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 say if if it comes out automatically in some models, like for example, there are the simplest models is uh, supersymmetry. Say I, I will come to it. In supersymmetry, there is something called R parity, which is imposed for some other reason, but it also keeps the dark matter stable. In extra dimensions, there is a symmetry called KK uh, parity. Okay, there is also called KK parity which keeps the lightest colossal plane mode stable. The same thing happens for universal extra dimensions. If you think of any BSM model you can think of, in all these models, there is some symmetry. Now, if you don't have these symmetries, you don't have these models in which there's an automatic symmetry like R parity or something, okay? Uh, if you don't have, <coughs> uh, uh, this kind of a scenario, okay, in uh, any of this uh, uh, model, uh, say for example, uh, so let's just say, I, I don't care about some BSM models or something. In such a case, suppose if I add explicitly some dark matter candy, I have to impose something to make it, keep it symmetric. Like for example, um, okay, let's take standard model plus some dark matter candy. So it could be a scalar or a fermion or something. So I just write some del mu phi, rather del mu phi, it's some scalar, okay, mu phi square. So it has some mass, mu phi, okay. So I write this Lagrangian, say for example, 
But then I have to interact it somehow with the standard model. So I write a term phi dagger phi h dagger h. So I write such a term. But then I don't want uh, I don't want it to decay. Essentially, there could this could be a decay to phi to two exists or something. Essentially, no, I don't want such decays to happen. So I don't want decays in which phi decays to two exists and this exists will decay into fermions and so on. So, okay, I don't want any of these kind of things for whatever be the mass of this phi. For whatever be the mass of this phi, this is exactly like the case which. Uh, Kamalia was saying about like because it's a heavy particle, it can decay into two exists or something. Now, how do I do I control it? I say that okay, phi goes to minus phi. I just impose a simple symmetry. So no coupling in which phi goes to minus phi, some discrete symmetry is imposed on this Lagrangian. I impose this discrete symmetry on this Lagrangian such that phi uh, what happened now, such that this kind of couplings are not allowed actually. Okay, so that way these decay modes are not allowed. You can have scattering and everything, but you don't have decay modes. You can have a virtual phi, but as long as you say that this symmetry, a simple symmetry is sufficient, but this symmetry will keep the dark matter candidate here. This is a scalar example. Okay to be stable. So you can start with very complicated symmetries like R parity and so on, so, or color uh, line theory or KK parity or any of these things in which there's a huge structure in which there is some sort of symmetry automatic to all the way down to imposing a symmetry as simple as simple discrete symmetry, okay? Such that <clears throat> some, uh, all the, uh, DK operators in TD are disallowed and only scattering operators are allowed. Okay, that way you can keep the dark matter actually stable. In models, in some models it's automatic, in some models you have to impose it. But uh, in all models, in all models, there is some symmetry to keep it stable. In all models, actually, there is always some symmetry. Okay. Okay, sorry for this uh, small digression because uh, I think that was an important point she mentioned because it's a very important property of dark matter. Okay. Uh, so if you want to build any dark matter model, you have to know what is the severity to keep it stable. And that's the reason why I was emphasizing it. Okay. Uh, so, okay. So that's about stability. I will come to it in explicit models actually. But now let's come back to WIMP. So we will somehow assume that WIMP is uh, stable, somehow stable. And so it doesn't have any decay operators, but it only has annihilation operators. So like some simple symmetry, like phi goes to minus phi or something is imposed, or there could be some larger symmetry. Okay. So, but it can annihilate through uh, such diagrams. And sometimes it can also have Higgs here, essentially. Like the case we see first. Okay. okay. So this is the simplest model. Now, the point uh, why WIM became popular because it became the go to thing because of two reasons. Okay. Uh, one, Big Bang cosmology predict something called the PIM miracle. Today we'll see this. So the second reason why BIM became popular is that it can be tested. So uh, even if you don't have uh, uh, okay, even if you don't have uh, exactly weak interaction like strength or something, 
thermal dark matter is the main idea here essentially okay so what this idea and then we'll come to being particular actually so it is a part of the thermal background the thermal dark matter. what is this idea of thermal dark matter uh, so here i think uh, the two main references are cobb and tanner um this is uh, very good i think what happened to this yeah. cobb and tanner which does a very good detailed job about this actually it's a very good book uh the second one is total sum cosmo modern cosmology uh early notes this is early notes <clears throat> i think coben turner uh, indian edition is there so you can use it easily it's, uh, it's old but it is very good book dolores and modern cosmology is also good very good it's one of the best books that i've seen sometimes then there is peacock's uh, cosmological physics uh, which uh, has some good uh, good stuff i used it occasionally i don't have any, if somebody has a soft copy please send it to me i don't have a copy of it <laughs> okay yeah okay now let's look at thermal dark the thermal dark matter essentially starts with the idea that you have a big bang uh at the start of at the end of the big bang and everything what do you mean by big bang cosmology is that you start with the gas of photons and all particles in thermal equilibrium at some some temperature t this t could be much let's start with around hundreds of gv or something say so let's start with a few hundreds of gv so that all the standard model particles are also in thermal equilibrium with each other thermal equilibrium means uh, both chemical as a, as well as thermodynamic equilibrium okay kinetic equilibrium both the equilibriums are satisfied so it is in thermal equilibrium so uh, and this gas of photons is expanding by a rate set by the hubble constant the hubble constant essentially is that uh, uh, it is the rate at which the scale factor a is modified with respect to a. So this is not the hubble constant the scale factor is essentially the metric of the frw This is the metric of the FRW. So this is a scaling factor. So x minus essentially uh, how much x minus the space is expanding. Okay, as the time is progressing. So the rate at which the space is expanding, okay, is essentially uh, the velocity factor. Essentially, is the Hubble constant. <laughs> so. Uh, given this setup essentially now what you want to do is that there is some annihilation process also happening so the annihilation process is essentially as uh, so the chi chi 
going into some particles FFR say let us say. And as long as the inverse reaction is maintained, as long as the inverse reaction is maintained, these particles are in thermal equilibrium. Okay, these are in thermal equilibrium. But then the inverse is expanding. As the inverse is expanding, uh, the number density of uh, chi will reduce, number density of chi will reduce. So what is happening is that they may find difficulty to find another one another. They may find difficulty to find another. So to maintain thermal equilibrium will be slightly a difficult actually. But still, let's just say that they're still in thermal And so as the inverse is expanding, the temperature is also reducing. So the temperature is now, what we want is, what is the number density? What is the number density? You start with the initial number density, equilibrium number densities. Let's say an N chi zero, essentially. N chi zero is equilibrium, or some people use N chi equilibrium. Okay, is the equilibrium number density. This is given by Fermi Dirac. Distribution. Or Boseman, uh, or Bose Einstein distribution. So you have this number density, okay, and chi of zero is equal to some dpq, some function essentially, which is given by some number density, okay, equilibrium number density, uh, which can be approximated, say for example, in the limit MT, uh, uh, is uh, as the, the mass decreases essentially. Okay, so this just becomes temperature. Uh, this distribution, you know, I think. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, okay. One second. This distribution essentially becomes in the limits. Uh, let me see, it should be mt power three by two, two e power minus mt, m by t, when I am much, much greater than t. As the mass of the particle becomes greater than the temperature, ambient temperature, so this is three by two, okay. So you have this initial distribution, okay? Now, uh, maybe one second, give me one second. So on the left hand side, should that be Kai Kai bar? Ah, you're right. Actually, there is a severe um, um, uh, if our area is completely inundated by water and everything for the last few days. And so it is very, very hard to come to this uh, institute, actually. It's not easy. Okay. Uh, and then you must have read it in newspapers that they're finding fish and everything. Okay, <laughs> all right, on the, on the, and we didn't have power all of us. Okay, somehow uh, the generator was running, and after a while, everything got uh, all the generator and everything completely went away. And so, yeah, I said, okay, uh, maybe, and the traffic is nightmare actually. So, okay, so let's start with some, uh, what, do get, what do you call uh, equilibrium number densities. So to solve this, what happens is that we need to use something called uh, uh, Boltzmann equations. Okay, 
these Boltzmann equations uh, tell you that uh, uh, <coughs> uh, how the what is the final number density when the particle is decoupled? So, what is the radi uh, so what is the criteria when the particle is decoupled? or the, when the particle is undecoupled. So the criteria is essentially given by, okay, we'll come to the distribution. So, so what we want is to start with thermal time, equilibrium, all the way we want to find out the number, you have some number density here. This is given by statistical mechanics. Okay, this is the equilibrium number density. Now I want to evolve all the way time, all the way, the idea is that it should decouple, decoupling time. As the universe expands, these particles should decouple. So what is this decoupling time? Uh, so the decoupling time is that, so if gamma should be less than or equal to H. So that means that gamma is your interaction rate, so okay, interaction rate of a particle. So your decoupling time is given by gamma should be much, much uh, or less than or equal to H. And that's when you actually decouple. Okay. So you start with uh, uh, some equilibrium number density in terms of some phase space distribution, no, essentially. So, so you have some number density some number density at equilibrium time, say for example, G. So G is some something called degrees of freedom. And then it will be some D cube, whatever it is, D cube P, F of E P. S T, sorry, uh, F of E T. So you then take Some uh, some uh, limits essentially. So you take the limit in which m, m is much much uh, greater than t, you get this exponential suppression which I was talking about yesterday for the number of particle distribution essentially at the equilibrium time. It, if a particle remains equilibrium at a given temperature t, so it as the mass increases, the number density of the particle decreases. The number density decreases because as the mass increases, you produce fewer and fewer particles. You produce fewer and particles, and then they cannot remain in equilibrium. They cannot remain, uh, they have to annihilate. Okay, they have to annihilate, right? Okay. Now, but if their annihilation rate, if their annihilation rate is, is smaller than the rate at which the universe is expanding. Okay is smaller than the rate at which uh, the universe is expanding. So they will end up, uh, their number density will start freezing in. Their number density will start. So they decouple from the expansion of the universe. Essentially. They'll decouple from the expansion of the universe. But in the opposite case, when their interaction rate is greater than the expansion rate, okay, they start, I mean, they are still in, they can remain in thermal equilibrium. So if we want to evolve, what is the final number density? Because we know what is the final number density. This number density, we know, as I mentioned that this number density is important because I want to match it with, this, uh, with omega is roughly around 0.3, essentially. We want to match it with 0.26, okay? So I want to find this uh, number density at decoupling time. What I need to do is evolve from thermal equilibrium time to all the way to decoupling time. The initial conditions I know because I assume now thermal distribution functions for the number density. With that, I want to evolve up to the decoupling time. So this is the basic idea. So for this, I use something called Boltzmann equations. So the Boltzmann equations, I'll start off with the form, which is uh, sort of already uh, simplified, actually. You can write it in terms of something called the uh, uh, 
collision term so times the louisville operator and we can start off doing uh, start the louisville operator equal to the uh, a collision operator and then in an frw metric and what happens and so on so all this i leave it as homework <laughs> i leave it for you guys to do it okay so in the end you end up having so dn by dt number density of the particle is equal to some three times the expansion rate or which is also called the dilution rate this form you have seen already times n square minus n equilibrium square so this is something called thermally average cross section so this is the cross section for the annihilation but it is thermally average so what it means that So uh, now you get a uh, cross section, say for example, per given momenta or something. So for example, for input momenta, if you calculate this cross section, so P1, P2, so on, so on. So. Now this has to be thermally averaged in the sense that now you have to uh, convolute this cross section, okay? Okay, this is called zero temperature cross section. We had to convolute to it by adding the thermal distributions of each of these initial states, essential initial states, okay? So P1, P2. So they have thermal distribution depending on the temperature. So then you convolute the cross section and the resulting cross section essentially is equal sigma. And there are expressions, explicit expressions for this uh, sigma out of P in literature. So this is sigma dot P. Sometimes yeah, I'll come to that one second. Okay. Uh, no, first term, no. the sign is negative. Uh. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, okay, maybe I should write in the familiar form. Is it good? <laughs> yeah. Okay. In the this form is fine. Yes. This is the standard form, actually. Yeah. So there's a minus sign here. You're right. Okay, I'll, I should be negative because, okay, uh, let me finish this one and come to you. So this is called thermally average cross section, which is multiplied by n square minus the, uh, the difference between the equilibrium number density and the square of it, okay? Square of the differences between the equilibrium number densities, essentially uh, the difference between the normal present number density and equilibrium density. Okay. okay. That is one thing. This is purely taking care. This is purely taking care of the gamma part. Essentially, the interaction rate, how it reduces the uh, number density. Now, what is this? This is called sometimes called the dilution factor. As uh, somebody has actually said, this should be negative actually. So this takes care of the fact that university is expanding. Okay. <laughs> the universe is expanding and so what's happening with this uh, evolution right okay what's happening with, uh, with the number density the, this is essentially as the universe is expanding uh, how the number density is changing that is essentially the thing which is sometimes also called the dilution factor okay the dilution term or dilution factor is something whatever it is dilution term or something Okay, and thanks for correcting the sign because on the right hand side it should be negative. So now instead of uh, doing that, what one does is one calculate uh, one. Uh, this is a nonlinear differential equation. No, we don't have any analytical solutions for this because uh, anyway, I think it's uh, some form of Riccati equation. Okay, so it's some nonlinear differential equation. You won't be able to solve it uh, analytically. We can try to solve it in certain limits because, because it's y square. You can, 
get some expressions uh, in certain limits, but not completely. If, so if there is a single y square type term, uh, so a y square in the sense square, a square term, essentially this is d n n square term. So you can uh, try to solve it, but then uh, that uh, it has to be, you can give an analytical expression, but that analytical expression would also have some integrals which are have to be solved. So you can solve it in analytically in terms of some integrals. Okay, and these integrals have to be solved uh, uh, numerically. Okay, now the best way to solve this is essentially uh, you change the variables from t to uh, x, where x is equal to uh, m by t, okay, and dx by dt is h. Okay. Did I write it correctly? Yeah. Uh, uh, Maybe there's a factor um, dx by dt would be m or h. I think there is a factor m. Yeah. Okay. So you use this uh, uh, x is equal to uh, x is equal to this thing. So t goes to x is equal to m by t. Okay, and then you also change number density to something called yield. <clears throat> so now this yield is nothing but number density by the entropy density. S is equal to entropy density. <clears throat> now, uh, the reason why I do that is essentially that uh, when you do this, the expansion will not have any role because uh, this is uh, in, uh, under the expansion, the entropy is always conserved. So assuming that uh, uh, entropy is conserved, total entropy is conserved, S will scale something like inversely to the volume of the universe. As the volume increases, okay, uh, S will become smaller and smaller. Okay, it, it scales as well. So, this this becomes something like a co-moving volume. Essentially, it becomes like a co-moving volume. So the expansion of the universe will not play a big role in the yield. Okay. So you want to remove the effect of the expansion, or no, no. Let me not say that because you want to consider the effect of you want to transform the effect of the expansion of the universe into some quantity. Okay, which is sort of uh, takes into account automatically the uh, the expansion of the universe. So this is something called como William number density. So this co-moving number density is essentially it take it is the number density uh, defined as the universe uh, as the expansion of the universe is changing. Okay, as the expansion of the universe, but so what happens is the y doesn't change. Y doesn't change with the expansion of the universe. Okay, as the number density changes with the volume, s changes inversely with the volume. So y doesn't change with the, with the expansion of the universe. So with this, you can write your uh, differential equation as x 
y y equilibrium uh, <coughs> dy by dx x is m by t is equal to minus n equilibrium again sigma annihilation cross section times the velocity divided by h and y equilibrium square minus one okay i think i wrote it correctly yeah So this is essentially uh, now some uh, like for example you can keep the y equilibrium you can need not divide it by y equilibrium or so and so but anyway this is essentially what the idea is now let's see if we can get some limits essentially so uh, you can now you can have some idea about y equilibrium in certain limits, essentially in the extremely relativistic limit or extremely non-relativistic limits, essentially. Okay, so uh, uh, so okay, um, okay, uh, you, uh, okay. Let me. Okay, uh, that's not. Uh, let me. Should I say that? Okay. You have some limits actually. You can rightly write in terms of some exponential suppressions and so on. So you can do that. But okay, let's leave that. Okay. So when it's uh, the point is that if it is non relativistic you have some y equilibrium also. You have some kind of, like like I said in the limit m tends to greater than or equal to t. Okay. The same limit you can also re-express in terms of uh, y. So if, for example, in the non relativistic limit y. Uh, equilibrium will be given by some constant, some constant times g by g star. Uh, okay, this is some degrees of freedom. You can take it as some numbers essentially. Some x power three by two e power minus x. This is exactly the same form what we wrote down here. It's exactly the same form what we wrote down. Okay, except that now you are writing in terms of m by t instead of this thing. Okay, <clears throat> so this is exactly the same form which we wrote down. Some some constant times y equilibrium. So it has some. We know what is y equilibrium at uh, in the non relativistic limit. Now the basic idea is that if you have vim, so if we have vim. Uh, if with the cross section and mass so m square is roughly equivalent to mv square mv square is around 100 g square okay and then you also say that sigma v one by sigma v okay rather than that one by sigma v <coughs> is also of the roughly the same model Because it's weak interactions, no? Because we assume that they're also the roughly same model. Okay. Okay. Now, at what x uh, this uh, factor goes to? Uh, meaning, uh, what uh, at uh, what? x value say for example at what sigma v let me put it this way at what sigma v can we say that uh, this solution happens essentially so we have a solution for uh, uh, v essentially what uh, uh, at what sigma v now if you ask what is the sigma v at which y turns into non relativistic uh, uh, y has the non-relativistic, uh, uh, essentially, 
uh, number density essentially. What is the number density at which it rises to? So the basic idea is that what we want is uh, uh, something called y infinity. Okay. So uh, now uh, let me. Okay. So why th this difference? This is essentially difference between some delta, delta between y and y equilibrium squares essentially. So this is the delta is the difference between y and y equilibrium square. I, I, can you see my pen? So what is happening at early times, you all start with equilibrium times. You all start with equilibrium, then y, y is equal to y density. So this term is very, very small. This term is extremely small at early times. So typically you hear that at the freeze out, what is important is the late times, right? The maximum contribution comes to the late times. Why it happens? Because y, uh, when y square is equivalent to y equilibrium, this is equivalent to one. So the difference between one and this is very, very small. Okay, at early times, this difference is very, very small. But now when a, 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 as the universe expands and if sigma, this quantity, uh, this quantity of the right range is of the right range, essentially, what happens is, Y will start becoming uh, much bigger than Y equilibrium square, much bigger than Y equilibrium square. And so this term becomes significant. The yield becomes significant, okay? So this term starts becoming significantly larger, okay? And you can show that uh, uh, this term, you can analytically show that, suppose if I call in at this thing, essentially some constant, okay, this constant, which is related to um, uh, this sigma v and h and everything. So this constant, essentially, so let me call it as lambda. It's called, call lambda is equal to some h x times sigma annihilation cross section times v thermally averaged times s by h. In that case, your equation is essentially uh, okay, dy by dx is equal to minus lambda x power minus n minus two So this is again y square minus y equilibrium square or same thing, okay. Um, okay, and now oh, forget about this uh, n factor. Okay, uh, this is, I, I think if you do it carefully, there's an n factor coming in because it's some of sums or all the, uh, all the, uh, this expansion in the series essentially. So, but okay, because I'm using two different uh, notations here, it's slightly confusing, but I wanted to bring the physics out. So, uh, the basic any some number, some some number, some integer, okay, okay, which is just uh, expansion. Now, when you do this, when this this delta essentially becomes large, delta is very very large. Okay, you can integrate it from all the way from the freeze out time, from the freeze out time to all the way from x is equal to s freeze out to all the way to infinity. So when you do that, you get something called y infinity, which is equal to essentially this delta, which essentially is this delta. Okay, so this is nothing but some n, some number times lambda x n. So what you're at the freeze out, the relic density is just, meaning as it turns numerical, uh, as it turns, uh, uh, as it turns non-relativistic, 
or it as it decouples. Say, for example, as it decouples, the number of density from that point to the present time it starts increasing because the universe is uh, expanding. Whereas this number density is sort of frozen, it's sort of frozen because it uh, its rate of annihilation is much much smaller than the rate of the uh, expansion of the universe. Okay, now you can look at, now I'm coming and following the um, Coburn tunnel actually. So the basic idea here uh, essentially is that as you increase, this is the famous plot for WIMP. This is X is equal to M by T and this is essentially time. So you start with some co-moving number density. Okay. And if there is no freeze out, it will go off like this. But depending upon this lambda, as the lambda increases, okay, it can start freezing out, meaning the number density will start freezing it out. So as, as lambda increases, it starts falling off. It starts falling off. So increasing lambda, okay, it starts falling off. So it freezes out like this. So instead of going down like this, when there is instead of going down as with exponential x x for p, okay, this is co-moving number density or yield. Okay, this starts. So what is happening here is depending upon what this lambda is, or lambda is nothing but your sigma v. As your sigma v is increasing, as your sigma v, it freezes out at later and later uh, at different points in the number density at different points. So this is your number density at certain point. This is your number density. So this is your. You start with the common number density of say point zero zero one. This is your number density, say uh, 10 power minus 10 or 10 power minus, because it's logarithmic, no, it's essentially 10 power minus 4, 10 power minus 3, 10 power minus 2, so on. So, so this is generically, so this is some number density, so which goes all the way up to 10 power minus 40 or something. So it's some, some number density which is rapidly in decades, essentially, because you remember that you are in a log scale 0 0.1, this is 1, and then uh, uh, and so on, so, so 0 0.001, 0, uh, sorry, 0 0.001, this is 0 point, it should reduce. 0, 0 0.1, this is 10 power minus 3, 10 power minus 4, 10 power minus 5, so on, so on. You can several orders of magnitude, the number density is reducing. But then at some important point, the number density just freezes out, and where it freezes out depends upon what your sigma v value is. Okay? What your sigma? It's almost roughly independent of the mass of this particle. Essentially, what your sigma v is the important point. Okay, so this is just from this equation. I am not doing anything. This is the equation which tells you that. So if you have roughly uh, sigma v around uh, 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 sigma v of some value, it comes out that the yield will fix choose a relic density or co-moving relic yield in such a way such that this gives you the correct answer. What is this relation to relic density? The relation to relic density is essentially omega chi is equal to some m co-moving volume, uh, this thing at x is equal to infinity. So if your yield is correct, and correct range essentially, mass of course is important, but this factor is independent of mass, okay? This factor is roughly independent of mass, whereas omega requires mass, okay? Roughly around mass essentially. Okay, so this means for present day essentially, if you expand everything what we know, this gives me 10 power minus 10 GeV power minus 2. 
sigma a b because i didn't know what a sigma v is i just put this solution here you put this back this solution here and you get an expression with numbers around this value the present using the number association so what is a wimp miracle <laughs> the wimp miracle tells you that sigma a v is nothing but alpha square and big square is 10 power minus 9 g square. Okay. This is a wind marker. So if you assume, uh, this is for mass around 100 g, you say, for example. So if you assume weak interactions, okay, if you assume weak interactions, the sigma v falls in the correct regime, it falls in the correct regime of around 10 power minus 9 g squared in this unit essentially. Okay. Uh, this should be minus 2, no? This should be minus 2. Yeah. Of the correct regime such that you get your omega of the order of 0.1. So we need Observed omega is omega dark matter is around 0.1. So if you want to get omega dark matter of 0.1, the sigma v should be around 10 power minus 9, which comes out accurately as we wanted. Okay. That's the reason why this is called a wimp miracle. So all we assumed, let me just rephrase it again and essentially that all we assumed, of course, this has to be done numerically, but we just try to show some semi-analytical results. All we assume that there is some annihilation cross-section, and then there is some equilibrium number density, which is thermal in nature, which is thermal in nature. So that is the only assumption we made. And the second assumption I made is on the cross-section sigma v. Okay? So, Okay, so I am assuming a freeze out like mechanism in which the particle of a certain mass falls off from equilibrium because the universe has moved much faster, expanded much faster. The rate of expansion of the universe has become much faster. Okay, so it cannot be in equilibrium with the rest of the particles. Okay, <clears throat> the rest of the universe. So this sort of decouples. Okay, it's no longer in equilibrium with the universe. So it decouples. Okay, uh, this is given by this gamma uh, is equal to sigma h essentially. This should be smaller than interaction strength should be equivalent to the gamma. Gamma is essentially the, uh, the rate of conversion essentially, okay, which is uh, also related to this one essentially. Okay. Uh, with the, this is the only assumption. So if we have a dark matter which has cross sections like weak, uh, uh, like with weak interactions, okay, and if it is thermally produced and it freezes out purely, it freezes out purely because of solving of the, like its its interaction strength falls below the expansion rate, and after it freezes out its number density increases to the present epoch because, and I solve it all the way up to infinity. Okay, I'll solve it all the way. This is an assumption that our infinity is very large. Okay, it is just an uh, uh, assumption in the sense that when I say infinity, meaning you can, uh, essentially t goes to zero, essentially. That's basically the idea that t goes to zero. Okay. Uh, when the, okay, all the way up to infinity. And then, I see that for if I want to get the correct number density of the present day universe, which is roughly 0.1 times the uh, uh, the critical number density or critical density of the universe, energy density of the universe, in certain units of h square. Okay, this is omega h square. By the way, omega h square is equal to 0.1. So I see that just assuming weak interactions, just assuming weak interactions gives me the correct number density. 
So this game under the name of Pimp Merkel. Okay. This is something called the Pimp Merkel. Any questions on this? Okay. It still has, has to be shown numerically most of the time. Okay. And these equations are not, uh, uh, you are need to really run photon codes or something. Okay. But we try to get some analytical understanding. Okay, we try to get some analytical understanding. So, uh, this is wonderful. Okay, so this became quite popular. This became quite popular. So, what people started asking, okay, started by Witten and company. Okay, and Witten wrote a paper with an exponent list essentially trying to detect. Uh, Weekly interacting massive particles, okay. and that led to the direct detection experiments. So the direct detection experiments essentially <coughs> invert <coughs> this Feynman diagram. So you could have a Z or a whatever some dark matter candidate interacting with the Z or sometimes with the H, okay, goes away, essentially some elastic scattering, essentially chi. And here, this can be a bound state. Of some protons or something, okay, some nuclear. So when they do this, uh, so when they have this direct detection because dark matter is everywhere and so when they, these dark matter particles come and impart some part of momenta on these neutrons and protons, they start a little bit of vibrating or something essentially. Okay, they start displacing from their position a little bit because it's elastic scattering essentially most of the time. It could be an elastic also. Let's assume elastic scatter at the present. Inelastic means the particle also changes, but let's, uh, for the present, let's just worry about elastic scattering. So, so the difference in the energies is typically in very metal, so KV essentially, so very little energies, very close to the thresholds. The, the threshold of the energy at which we can measure this, uh, uh, these excitations of the nuclei is also around the same energies. And so, <clears throat> the energy is expect, uh, uh, expected at our KV, the threshold and the signal are roughly close to each other, very close to each other, okay? So these are extremely difficult uh, direct detection experiments. And the latest ones are, I think, Lux, Xenon, NT, and so on, so essentially, okay? Uh, and Presently, um, the plot goes somewhat like this. So, uh, okay, I hope I'm somewhat clear. So it uh, it look at cross section here, uh, and then this is the limit you get from the experiments, and this is the mass. So around eighty or so, this is a dip sixty or eighty essentially, something around this eighty GeV. Let me just say something to. Our friends, dark matter friends, can tell more. And this is all the whole gears goes to one TV or so. And this in the units of weak interaction cross section. So this is already touching. So, so if you look at, at these limits, so there's somewhere nearby is something called the neutrino floor. So here the neutrino floor essentially is that the background will be dominantly coming from neutrinos. Okay. And if the because neutrinos are so numerous, so numerous, and so the background is so significant, we cannot distinguish between a dark matter and a neutrino. So you won't be able to distinguish uh, a dark matter from a neutrino in this in this region. 
So you won't be able to distinguish dark matter from neutrino here. So you want, so our hope is that the cross section is not as low as neutrinos, but <clears throat> it's still a weak interaction cross section. So so far that result has not been successful. Essentially, that exploration has not been successful. Okay, so the limits are pretty strong actually, and. Uh, these people have started questioning whether there is a so there are several reasons several outcomes uh, so uh, several things one can do actually so okay the summary is is that direct detection experiments put significant constraints on WIMP dark matter significant constraints constraints on WIMP dark matter especially in the mass range, which is favored. Essentially, this mass range, which is roughly, uh, which is favored in this region, there is a very significant, now if you push it very high, 400 GB, 500 or something like that, okay, the limit, uh, you can still survive with the cross sections of this type. But <coughs> in most models, this cross section is, um, of this type, this uh, of this energy. So WIMP, uh, the result is that WIMP, which has been pretty popular all these years, for the last uh, 34 years or something. So this is under trouble from direct detection experiments, which initially people thought that they were not possible. These experiments, people were thinking that those experiments are not possible, but they look to be possible and they seems to be ruling out significant region of the beam paradigm, okay, significant region. So people started looking out ways out of it, okay, people started looking out ways out of it, whether the dark matter is non-thermal in nature, okay, so non-thermal dark matter, okay, then there is freezing, then there is conilations, it could is thermal dark matter, but it's a lot of conilations. So there are particles of roughly the same mass and interaction strength. So you can play around with it and so that the direct detection experiments can be uh, significantly weakened actually. So there, <clears throat> there are a number of such ways out essentially. Okay. <clears throat> so each of them uh, requires a new kind of standard model, physics beyond standard model. Each of them is quite different compared to what is uh, uh, the regular BSM physics essentially. Okay, <clears throat> uh, I'm thinking if there are any other ways, no coagulations, please. Uh, so non-thermal dark matter involves non-thermal, uh, non-canonical cosmologies also, and so on and so. So there are quite a few of these uh, uh, reasons, and then there's also heavy, very heavy dark matter. <clears throat> so these are all the possible outcomes, but as we, as I said, that we don't know what is it, uh, uh, exact nature of the dark matter as of now, but it would be nice, but that wind, which can be, it, it gives you some lower limits essentially, but wind is still viable, but subject to this, these constraints, but possibly it can be detected, you know? Say for example, uh, cert, unless certain regions start touching the neutrino flow, in all the other parameter space, it can be detected actually. So that is, makes it exciting. And WIMP can also be produced in colliders. <clears throat> so there is a possibility of seeing WIMPs in colliders also. So all these re reasons still make it an attractive possibility. That, uh, that's the reason why when we build physics beyond standard models, we'll be looking for a wind candidate within them. Essentially, we'll be start looking at the wind candidate for them. Okay. So even though these uh, there are significant constraints, but the possibility is that okay, maybe the wind is not in this parameter range, but it is in a different parameter range. Which is not explored by the experiment. So, so yes, that possibility still exists. So it is not directly 
Uh, the experts don't exactly say uh, the BMP is completely ruled out, but it is becoming uh, uh, low energy, low mass limbs are slightly becoming difficult actually, slightly becoming difficult. Okay, so, okay. Um, any questions on this today? Uh, how do I see people? Okay. Um, any questions today? Okay, so for most of you, you may know all these things, but uh, maybe just a repeat. But uh, for some, maybe it's new actually. Okay, uh, so we'll stop here today, and uh, next class would be again uh, uh, offline. Okay, and then we'll talk about uh, other theoretical problems like uh, strong CP problem, and uh, this is about dark matter. So dark matter here, I'm talking about WIMPs. But if there is some non-WIMP dark matter also, we can, we'll discuss, uh, we'll see. Meaning the end point is that um, <clears throat> we should uh, have some kind of dark matter candidate in our, in our physics we have started with. Some kind of dark matter candidate. That's extremely important actually, whether it, it's a wimp it's very good it can be tested if it's not a wimp but if there is some signature for it it's even better okay all right uh, so if there are uh, no questions maybe i'll stop here okay so yeah okay